Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. We appreciate it. My Art Kirsch, my co-founder of Celebrating Act 2, and our favorite food and travel writer, John Mariani. John, it's so good to see you again. Good to be seen. And John, I have a question for you now that, uh, uh, while well, it's not over, but in, particularly in New York where things are opening up because it's now much more under control, um, has your approach to, and I know you're going out eating a lot more, but have your approach to being a critic changed, uh, at least in this early period, post-pandemic in the New York area? Uh, is there, are you approaching what you're, the way you're reviewing things differently? Uh, well, we, we spoke about this on another show uh, to a certain extent. And mm -hmm. basically what I said uh, is that we are much more uh, forgiving because we realize that this is not, no, the, no restaurants operating at, at its peak form. Um, for all sorts of reasons I'll be happy to get into now. So reviewers have taken away the stars. They don't give stars anymore. They are going wherever the new places need to be buoyed up. And this is something that I think everybody has to realize when they go out. Uh, both of my sons are in top executive positions in the restaurant world. One is a, a managing director of uh, overseeing six restaurants plus um, the uh, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens uh, foods. And uh, so he has a tough job going between all these restaurants. Some are still not open. And my other son is the um, director of, of all food and beverage operations at a hotel, a new hotel in Brooklyn. And two years ago when they had these jobs, um, they had assistant managers, managers, assistant managers, plenty of people. I mean, every week they just get scads of, of offers uh, to, for employment um, coming across their desk. And um, because contrary to popular belief, we talk about this a little bit also, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, a good restaurant in a good city it can be a very lucrative paycheck for waiters and, and even busboys. And increasingly now, even those bad guys like McDonald's and KFC, they're having they're forced to pay more to um, their employees, which is driving up costs. And so I want you to be I want people to be very very forgiving as you go to your restaurant and you used to get that favorite chicken parmigiana dish, uh, which used to be twenty one dollars, now it's twenty three bucks. Hey, what's going on? What's going on is that the uh, the prices of the food has gone up for the restaurateurs, so please understand that. And also, they don't have, uh, they are paying their employees more, which is a really good thing. And uh, third, as my sons are witness to, um, it's impossible to get some people, even though you could make 80, 90, 100 thousand dollars in food service as a uh, waiter or as a sommelier in a good restaurant. <clears throat> that being said, my sons have actually on occasion doubled as cashiers in their restaurants. I mean, these guys are top executives, and there they are clearing tables and, and being the cashier. Um, so it that's really rough out there. So the first thing you have to be cognizant of when you go to your restaurant is not to be demanding. You should never be demanding anyway as a, as a customer. You're not you're not going to get the best service if you're yelling at, at people and, and going, oh, brother, you know, how long is this taking to get the food and, and so forth? First of all, um, getting the food out of the kitchen is not the waiter's uh, fault uh, almost ever, uh, unless he's a really bad waiter. It's because the kitchen has not been able to keep up. The kitchen, which might have had six guys on the line before, now is down to four or even three. Okay, so that chicken parmigiana is taking longer to make for a higher price and you really have to understand that um, you have to understand that a lot of these waiters uh, were are brand new there's one restaurant here in New York called uh, uh, Mon Marche top restaurant always had top service and uh, Drew Nieparent the owner reopened about three or four months ago and found that none not one of his former employees came back. They had moved away. They had gotten jobs elsewhere. And he says, everybody who will serve you tonight, including the chef, is new. And I had to pay a guy who used to be a dishwasher here 
send him a plane ticket to the Dominican Republic to come back and work for me. That being said, you cannot expect that when you used to go to your favorite restaurant, you know, Shea Coleman's, and, hey, where's Tony, my favorite waiter? He says, well, he went back to Italy and retired. And who do you get that night? Rosita, who was never served before. So you, you, can't, you just cannot expect a lot of what you used to love about a particular restaurant, and especially a new restaurant, is going to pan out the way it used to. Prices are higher. Staff is shorter. Hours are longer. Um, real estate, the, the, the realtors, landlords, were pretty good to restaurants to keep them alive, uh, either by reducing their rent or, um, by, uh, or by carrying them and saying, fine, pay me, pay me what you can when, when you can. But now all bets are off, and I know uh, that a fine restaurant wanted to open an auxiliary kitchen uh, in Long Island City, and they were just about to sir, s s um, sign the contract. And the landlord said, tough luck, I got somebody who will pay more. Screw you. Sure. Um, this is a brave new world out there. Well, it's, it's a, uh, yeah. As we have uh, spoken before, uh, the one thing that uh, I really appreciate about you is that you, when, when you review something, you're always doing it in context. You're not apologetic, you know, because good food is good food. And you know the difference between good food and really great food because you've had it around the world. But you always do it in context. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's a really terrible meal, well, it's going to be a terrible meal. But you do it in context of understanding that, that things are different today than they were before. And I just wonder how many of your uh, uh, fellow professionals uh, are, are doing it in that same spirit. They are. They are. Um, uh, I know for a fact that uh, they are. Um, they're being more forgiving. They're being more amenable. And uh, you know, you know, there are people out there who go to restaurants to throw their own weight around. I expect a specific table. I expect a certain uh, waiter. I expect my wine to be a certain way and my food to be cooked a certain way. Even though the chef doesn't cook it that way, I want it to be cooked that way. Uh, well, I think you should stop going to those restaurants where you are now the center of attention. You always will be, but the customer is not always right by a long shot. And to presume that you are, because I've traveled the world, I've eaten at three-star Michelin restaurants in Paris where I paid $1,000 a meal, that doesn't mean beans um, if you are uh, just uh, the kind of person who is going in to find fault. Uh, don't find fault. Find the good in the restaurants. These people really, really treasure you. It is a hospitality business. And um, you should just bask in what, what they do do so well, night after night, week after week, lunch and dinner, uh, six, seven days a week. It's a tough profession. The margins of, uh, of net income are low, um, and the po prospects of going out of business because of undercapitalization is high. So, and uh, fact of that, you don't have to worry about that when you go buy a sweater at Bro Bloomingdale's, you know. Um, so what is a sweater? You may want to ask, but uh, oh, it's not the same quality that Brooks Brothers shirts used to be. Well, that's true, but you always have a lot of other options. In uh, restaurants, don't expect everything to be the same as it was before COVID. Yeah. I Wait, love, John, I love your... If they demand, by, because of state or local municipality, demands you have to wear a mask, do not go in there and throw a fit and do not fake vaccination cards. This, this, this puts you, as far as I'm concerned, among the, the worst people in the, in the human race who try and get away with this and lord it over the restaurateur himself for making you obey rules that he did not create. Yeah, yeah. I, I love your, uh, your inside view of the restaurant a fascinating industry, which of course we mostly don't want to know about. We just want to sit down and be served. That's you know? true. Um, and I noticed that great changes. We have a couple of great little Italian restaurants, family restaurants uh, near us. And uh, we went to one recently and I noticed, I hadn't been there in a while. I noticed that they cut the place in half. They're yeah. renting stores, you know, there's square footage in a, in a, in a, storefront, whatever whatever you call it. And so they had uh, a back room, if you will, which was the same size as the front room with the bar. It's gone. Now they have a patio. <laughs> well, and 
I think outdoors. In Southern California, that makes a great deal of sense. But yeah. but boy, has their life changed. And of course, they the, one of the reasons they don't have that back room anymore is they don't have the servers. Mm. You know, they've got the the husband and the wife, and they've got the cook, and they've got the the niece serving, and the I don't know who the kid is cleaning tables. Right. Uh, but you know, it's not a big staff. Yeah. And they all have to be trained. People think, you know, oh, okay, you're being hired as a busboy. Just take the dishes off the table. That's not the, all there is to that. And to be a waiter, there's a lot of things you have to memorize what the specials are. You have to know a good deal about wine. And you have to be something of a psychiatrist um, in order to take care of uh, various tables, all of which are very different. And the uh, people at those tables are very different. It's like, you know, you watch one of those Guy Fieri's divers and drive-in sort of thing. <clears throat> and he sticks the microphone into everybody. Oh, we come here four times a week. Oh, it's just like mom's home cooking. You know, um, well, that's not everybody. Obviously, those people are being edited. You don't get somebody who says, well, it ain't the way it used to be when I used to come here. Um, you don't get that. Uh, people are very, very different. There are people who love to throw their weight around. There are people who are very interested in just, I mean, so many, many times I say to the chef, send out your best. Just whatever you, you you choose the menu, okay? Some restaurants have fixed price menus, and that's that's what you do. You pay a certain uh, a price, and you will get what's on the menu. Um, not everybody likes it. The famous Chez Panisse out there in California, um, in Berkeley, is famous for this is what you're going to eat tonight. And if you don't like kidneys, well, that's the main course. <laughs> this has been a great conversation. Thank. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. See you soon. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.